Educational Lunch and Learn Program presented by Preservation Historic Winchester. I'm Ed Acker, Chairman of PHW's Education Committee, and we present these programs so that uh, we believe that the education of the public is the best way to preserve and understand our historic resources. We want to thank our host, Jim Vickers of Oak Crest Realty, for again offering PHW the use of this wonderful example of adaptive reuse. Today our speaker is Christopher Robinson, who's the superintendent at the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center, which is located in Frederick, Maryland. Chris Robinson began his career with the National Park Service in 1975. Following 16 years in various positions within the maintenance division at uh, Yellowstone National Park, terrible place to work, right? <laughs> Chris entered a three-year ex exhibit specialist training program with the Williamsport Preservation Training Center, which is the predecessor of the present training center, to pursue his personal and professional interest in historic preservation. Thank you for joining me. And thank you, Ed, for the, the introduction. Um, as, as Ed had stated, I am uh, the superintendent of uh, Historic Preservation Training Center, um, located in, in Frederick, Maryland. My hope today is to have a, a, maybe a bit more of a dialogue than um, a, a, a talking head. So I'll, uh, I'll move through the slide deck, uh, try to give everybody um, an orientation into our organization in, in the center, in the, in the center's work. Um, but it usually, when we, when we speak to the center and, and, and share with others, it usually um, encourages a lot of questions. So I want to leave some time to uh, dig a little deeper into any issues that are um, pertinent and relevant to yourselves. Um, so that I um, can just get a general sense of of the group. Um, how many folks are coming from the homeowner um, into historic Winchester or, or interest as a homeowner? Do you? City government? Good, good number. Contractors, architects, professionals? That kind of, kind of captures it. Hopefully what I, what I have to share will, will be of interest and um, not to um, Keep any any surprises. I would I'm really anxious to get towards the, the end of what I, I'm going to present, um, and, and that has to do with the work that we're doing with youth engagement, trying to develop the next generation of resource stewards. Something that I think will um, be of some importance to, to everybody in this room. It's certainly important to us and anybody who has um, interest or involvement in. Um, cultural resource stewardship, whether it is at the professional level or at the trades level, uh, I think uh, understands and recognizes that there is um, a shortage out there of, of individuals who are either trade practitioners or um, aspiring professionals. So it, it, is, it is our group, it, it is the work of uh, the Historic Preservation Training Center to not only introduce individuals to the um, the work of cultural resource management, but to, to help them develop. So, and we do that in, in what I would consider a very unique way, uh, certainly unique for a, a federal government entity. First, and just to, to, to touch on a little bit of, of what Ed has already shared, um, I've been with the National Park Service for over 40 years now. I um, entered my journey, uh, my, my career path with the Park Service as a maintenance employee, uh, as, a, as a trades practitioner, starting off seasonal position at, at the Kennedy Center. I was done as a summer internship uh, for my um, college program. And then I had uh, the, the great opportunity to, to move to Yellowstone, where I spent 16 years of, of my career um, doing a little bit of everything, but primarily trades work. And then towards the end of that uh, time there, I was working specifically on historic preservation work as, as, a, as a trades worker. I left Yellowstone, um, joined what was then the Williamsport Preservation Training Center located in Williamsport, Maryland, uh, and entered their three-year exhibit specialist intern program. 
Following that program, I moved on to fluorescent fossil beds to serve as a facility manager. Um, my hope was that I could take all this experience in, in trades and cultural resource management and, and apply it um, back into a park setting. Uh, and that, that was a, a very good experience, but there wasn't, for myself, there wasn't enough focus on um, cultural resource management and, and specifically the preservation of historic structures. <coughs> So given the opportunity, I returned um, to what had then become the his, Historic Preservation Training Center. As the superintendent of, of the training center, I'm responsible and, uh, for the management of 70 personnel, plus or minus. We, we fluctuate a little bit, but uh, it's, a, it's a fairly sizable staff, uh, a staff that consists of project <coughs> management, project managers, historic Architects, historical architects, excuse me, full complement of trades workers, um, leaders of those trade teams. We are, are managing uh, a three-year intern program, um, actually two, and I'll speak to them in a little bit more detail. One is the exhibit specialist program, um, the other is a preservation specialist program. And the, the, the difference is the exhibit specialist program targets individuals that have um, a solid trade background, construction background, and then we work to develop not only their preservation um, knowledge and skills, but their leadership skills. Um, so it's a three-year program. Uh, we're bringing in individuals, and then through action learning, we develop them up. Uh, this program that I went through benefited me um, very well, allowed me to really make that step out of uh, the, the trades work and more into a leadership role. Um, the preservation specialist is taking um, individuals who we would consider at the, the developmental level, a very above an entry level, but sub journey level, and helping them develop themselves um, to move from a sub journey level to a journey level with real emphasis on traditional trades, um, those activities, trade activities associated with um, historic preservation. So we'll take a uh, you know, production bricklayer out of uh, the private sector, definitely a good strong um, trade uh, experience, and then allow them to, to develop the, the skills, sensitivity needed for, for working on historic structures. Um, a new program, and this is the, the piece I'm, I'm anxious to, to speak to in a, in a bit more detail, is our Youth Corps Individual Placement Program. We're working with the Corps Network. Folks familiar with the Corps Network? Um, I, I don't believe there's one in, in uh, Winchester. Uh, the Corps Network is the umbrella group that oversees and helps manage um, upwards of 127 Youth Corps um, across the country. Um, it is the 21st century's Civilian Conservation Corps in many ways. You have job corps, you have historic corps, a, a number of them that deal with more trades, or, excuse me, trails issues and um, or urban park settings. So they, they, they touch on a number of different things. But uh, we're working with a core network to develop an entry level program, um, really an introduction into historic preservation in the, in the associated trade work. Um, in addition to our, what I refer to as our internal programs, we, we do some outreach, uh, specifically uh, for the National Park Service, although we, we do work for, for other groups, uh, nonprofits, other federal agencies, uh, local and um, county, city governments, in, in delivering workshops. And they can be a, a workshop classroom setting in introduction to the Secretary of Interior Standards, or it may be a, a multi-day workshop on best practices for repointing historic brickwork, and then everything in between. So that's, a, that's another little piece of business. We're also managing the, the PASS program, a Preservation and Skills Training Program. This is um, for National Park Service employees um, who are working in, in Park settings that are at sub journey level um, in, in ma some maintenance activity or trade. We select two people from each of our seven regions along with a mentor. 
through a mentor-mentee relationship, we help develop skills and, and uh, again, uh, a better understanding of best practices in, in historic preservation. And then lastly, we serve as a technical resource center, not in the same way that the technical assistance program in the Washington office um, works where they're talking tax credits and those types of things, but more in um, a homeowner is, is, is trying to um, get a little guidance on how to take care of their 18th century home or maybe specifics of talking about their brickwork associated with, with their building. We, we serve as a resource center for that. So that, that might apply to all of you at, at some point. You, you can certainly reach out to us and if we don't know the answer, we have uh, a lot of resources and, and network that uh, we can point you in the right, <clears throat> excuse me, the right direction. And to step back just for a moment from, from the center itself, we are aligned organizationally within the Department of Interior, um, is the, the department. The Bureau is the National Park Service. Um, within that, there is the Washington office, um, which provides oversight and guidance and, and delivers a variety of services out into the parks and into the regional offices. Um, within that Washington support office, there is the Associate Directorship of Workforce and Inclusion. Um, this is dealing with everything from HR matters to EO to learning and development, all, all things concerning our, our workforce. We then get to the Office of Learning and Development, and the, the Office of Learning and Development has a, a function in Washington, D.C., and three training centers. Um, the Albright Training Center located at the Grand Canyon. Uh, this is where we send our new employees for orientation. Um, it's, it's its primary purpose um, today is, is to serve as a um, facility to support that activity. We have the Mather Training Center located in Harpers Ferry. The Mather Training Center supports all of our distant learning um, programs as well as all of the career field programs. So it's fundamentals is the onboarding, um, then they enter into a career field and I'm, I'm speaking to cultural resources, maintenance, interp and education, uh, business practices, visitor and resource protection. These are all our various career fields within the National Park Service. So nested right in there in the Office of Learning and Development is the Historic Preservation Training Center. So we're, we're one of three actual centers. Mather and Albright have a residential program. We do not. As um, Ed, Ed mentioned, we're headquartered in Frederick, Maryland on the Monocacy Battlefield. Um, we also have a facility um, that we occupy through our, our occupancy lease agreement with the city of Frederick uh, that supports all of our preservation construction services. So just, just to give you a, a, a little bit of a, a picture of how we're all aligned, bureaucracy leaders, finally, finally get nestled down into, into the nuts and bolts. The what is now known as the Historic Preservation Training Center, was formerly known as the Williamsport Preservation Training Center. It was established in 1977. Um, a fellow by the name of Jim Askins um, was, was doing project work on the CNO Canal post, I can't tell you what hurricane it was, but there was major flooding on the Potomac River drainage um, that was really adversely impacting a, a lot of the resources associated with the CNO Canal. And Mr. Askins was was um, charged with doing a lot of that recovery work. And in very short order, he realized that he had a tremendous shortage of trained individuals, um, whether we're, we're talking um, masons or carpenters uh, to, to actually execute the work or people to um, lead these, these crews and teams working along the CNO Canal. Um, so it was his vision um, to establish a training center to take care of that need. So he dovetailed the work at hand and his vision for an opportunity to help develop people into what was then called the Williamsport Preservation Training Center. Headquartered um, in Williamsport, Maryland at the Cushwa Turning Basin. Uh, some very modest facilities um, were occupied. 
And following two floods in 1995, we had a major snow event in January, followed by uh, some significant rain, and um, we were flooded out of our facilities. And if you can imagine a, a major shop facility and, and warehousing facility within the floodplain, and we're given 48 hours to pack up and get out. It was a, a monumental task. We got ourselves resituated and got back to business. And then in September of that year, we had a, a, another, um, or had a hurricane at that point that again flooded the Potomac um, River drainage. And once again, we had to pack up and move. And it was at that time that our former superintendent, Tom McGrath, said, Enough is enough. Um, we're going to go and find ourselves some high ground. Um, so off to Frederick we went. And we didn't have a home at the time. We didn't even have a place to go. But uh, through um, some, some quick work on the leadership team at that time, um, we were able to identify the, the Gamble House um, at the, located on the Monocacy Battlefield uh, to serve as our headquarters building. The building had sat vacant for 20 years, a uh, better part of 20 years. It was infested with rodents and reptiles and lead paint. And it, it was a wreck. Um, but it so happened we had teams of people to address that work. So in a matter of um, a couple, three months, um, we readied that, that building to, to, to occupy for the headquarters. We then um, had the task of, of finding a, a facility that would support the preservation construction piece of our business. Um, and we were very fortunate to identify um, the Jenkins Cannery um, building. Ed's familiar with it. It is uh, post-Civil War, um, actually pre-Civil War, and, I, and we're going to struggle to recall the, the actual construction date, but uh, the Cannery Building Frederick served as a, a hub for um, agricultural processing. Um, it's where the tinning of, of vegetables was, was first invented and, and uh, started up. And so we, we were able to actually get into a historic building, which was our preference and um, immediately went to work in, in trying to ready that building. And it took many years to, to get it to where it is today, but it's, it's serving our needs. So I encourage uh, anybody that has interest or finds himself in Frederick to stop by either facility, um, look us up, um, although they're not generally open to the public, uh, at least on scheduled hours. Anybody with interest, we, we love to host a, a, a walk around to show everybody what we're doing. So, so please stop by. At, at about the time that we were moving out of Williamsport and into Frederick, um, there was some realignment going on in the federal government, and we had previously been administratively aligned under the Harpers Ferry Center, which is the, the facility in Harpers Ferry that does all the publications. They design and, and fabricate wayside exhibits. They, they do a lot of that type of work. So it, it was a good fit in some regards, but uh, we had the opportunity to, to, to be aligned within learning and development. So in um, 1995, we made that shift um, and, and really started to, to focus on the training piece of our business. Our mission, I'll give you an opportunity to, to read this, but I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. A primary mission is to provide preservation construction services in a safe manner that also allows for opportunities for employees to develop skills and, and, and develop themselves. So through, through a number of activities that, that I'll get to, that's, that's really who we are. The Historic Preservation Training Center is, is unique um, in, in many ways. We're probably best known for our preservation construction services, and when I say best known, anybody aware of the services we provide? Good. We provide preservation construction services to primarily to the National Park Service, but we also work out of, out of Bureau, working with uh, BLM, the Forest Service, Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, Frederick County, Maryland, Howard County, Maryland, um, on an occasion uh, for a nonprofit. Um, we are, that piece of our business is um, non-appropriated, so we, we work on a fee for, 
service model. That in itself, I think, is pretty unique in the, in the federal government. So um, if Shenandoah National Park is in need of some preservation work to address uh, you know, perhaps one of their cabins uh, for a fee, we will go and provide that service in many ways, much like a, a, a general contractor would do. Um, there are some real benefits um, to, to that approach, benefits on, on, on both parties. Um, anybody who has worked in uh, worked for in um, government understand the, the challenges and, and the work needed to um, develop contract documents and um, you know get things under contract. So we can really expedite that work. So we're best known for our, our preservation construction services, and secondly, we are known for the training that we deliver. Whether um, that is through our internships, um, our internal programs, or our external programs, um, going out and, and doing workshops in, in the parks and in other places. Organizationally, we uh, have a, a leadership and administrative team. It's about 15 individuals. Um, they're, as the, the names would suggest, uh, providing some leadership, myself, a deputy, um, and then an administrative staff. To, to take care of uh, the other 70 employees who are 60 employees or so that are out there actually doing the work. Um, we have a training division. Uh, this is two training managers that um, are addressing um, the needs of the facility maintenance and um, those who are, are undertaking historic preservation work. Um, they have the individuals who are developing competencies for various positions, developing curriculum for um, workshops and, and, and training that we're, we're doing, and then organizing those events. We then get into the trades. We have a carpentry section, a masonry section, and a woodcrafting section. <coughs> the difference between um, carpentry and woodcrafting in our business is the carpentry section is out doing in the field doing log repairs, um, putting on new roofs, doing uh, framing repairs, that stuff that is more field-based. The woodcrafting section is, is focusing on that work that's brought into the shop. Windows, doors, running millwork, building hand and carriages, those types of things. So the, the woodcrafting section is primarily um, confined to the, the shop environment. We have a small architectural team. Um, we do a little bit of design work, but for the most part, um, that small team is doing historic structures assessments and, and, and the reporting associated with that. They're doing historic structure reports, um, which are a deeper dive into um, looking at a building and its history. Um, they'll do other types of assessment work. Presently, they're working on developing training for Arlington National Cemetery, um, looking at their particular needs and, and working with our training managers to develop training components for um, the staff there at, at Arlington National Cemetery. And then lastly is the project management section. For those projects that are large in scale and lend themselves better to contracted services, that work goes to the project management division. And they're, they're managing those multi-million dollar projects um, that are beyond the, the capability and, and the resources that we have in, in taking what we refer to as a day labor approach. So the trade sections are, are, are working day labor. We're currently staffed roughly 50 trades workers, and we're, we're sending them out onto projects um, that, that can run in duration from three or four weeks, maybe six, to as much as six months. Um, right now, there's, there's folks working um, at, at Golden Gate National Recreation Area in San Francisco on uh, a historic seawall. We have folks working on monuments at Vicksburg. We have folks at, at Hampton Mansion um, in, in Maryland, Gettysburg. They're, they're dispersed out all over the country, um, usually consisting of teams of six to eight, eight persons. The work of our preservation um, construction services, I, I tried to pick up a couple things that, that folks may be um, somewhat familiar with. 
This, this work is, um, took place at Cedar Creek, Bell Grove National Historic Park, um, right down uh, the 81 corridor. Uh, and I think it, it serves as a, as a pretty good representation of um, the type of work we do. When it gets into interior decorative plaster, refinishing, um, floors, the more fine detailed work um, associated with um, higher style interiors, we stay away from. It doesn't lend itself to training, um, at least the type of training we're doing. So a lot of the work is more heavy construction. Um, this is a barn there at, at Cedar Creek. Obviously in the, the picture in your upper left hand corner is, is a pre-picture, pre-project pre work. We're um, replacing framing members, fixing exterior siding, <coughs> ensuring that the roof is tight. It also, I think, serves as an example of the limitations of the work we do. Um, as our name um, implies, Historic Preservation Training Center, we're really focusing on the preservation of buildings. We rarely get into any type of restoration or reconstruction work. We really get into rehabilitation work. We're we're really focusing on preservation. Um, in the case of monument work and, and, and some of that, it's more um, conservative work, but um, still it's, I don't want to say that it, it, it's lesser skill because it, it takes a lot of skill to be able to remove a framing component from a, from a bank barn and, and get a new one in place um, before everything starts to unravel and fall apart. Um, but I think this is a, is a pretty good example of, of the type of work that we're, we're doing um, through our carpentry section. This is uh, certainly a, a bit more complex. We have a long history of canal lock preservation. Um, this is where we start to move a little bit from, from pure preservation into a, a restoration um, type activity where we're building new lock gates. So this is, I want to say it's lock 22 on the, on the CNO Canal down towards Seneca Creek. So it, uh, it is pretty typical. The, again, the, the picture on your upper left is uh, before construction. Um, a lot of water passing through. Uh, historically, canal lock gates would, would need to be repaired or, or replaced you know, probably every five, six, eight, eight years. And, and <coughs> Park Service generally doesn't have luck. Or the resources to to take care of that. So through funding streams that are made available to come in and do a more uh, major project. Um, in this case, this was an American um, Recovery Act, um, ARA project. Fabricated uh, the gates, uh, replicating historic details, um, reusing historic hardware when possible, and um, reinstalling the gates. So these, these are the fun projects. A little anecdote: the, the first project I was assigned as a as an intern was one um, very similar to this on the Ohio and Erie Canal, and um, my mentor, my supervisor at the time, said, "Okay, Chris, you're going to uh, build some lock gates and you're going to restore a, a historic lock up on the Ohio and Erie Canal." I sort of scratched my head. Um, I was coming out of Yellowstone and hadn't seen. Uh, any, anything that resembled a, a, a canal lock, and I had to, I had to do some uh, serious home study, um, and, and spent a lot of time running around in the, on the CNO Canal to, to get my education on historic locks, historic lock construction, and um, how to fabricate lock gates. So, and, and to this day, 20, 20 some years later, it was the best project I ever worked on. Defunct canal lock, and actually put it back into operational um, use. This, this project here, I, I selected to, to showcase um, a, a little bit of our, our work. Uh, this is at Homestead National Monument of America in Beatrice, Nebraska. The, the building as it appears in the upper left-hand corner was in a floodplain. And a couple times a year, I want to say, the lower two or three feet of water, or the lower two, two or three feet of the building would be underwater. And it sat adjacent to um, the visitor center. Just prior to undertaking this project, they built a new visitor center up out of the floodplain um, on some high ground. And the, the park had an interest in moving this cabin. Um, just so that you know, 
this cabin was was moved to this location, so it it was uh, out of context, but it was from the immediate area. Uh, so the park um, had an interest in, in moving this cabin. Um, I don't know if the, the pictures. So I guess it does does show it to some degree. It was in it was in rough shape. It was racked. There, there wasn't a plumb line or a level line on that building. We explored a number of ways of, of trying to move it intact and, and made the determination pretty quickly that that, that just wasn't going to be feasible. So we, we took a dismantling and, and rebuilding approach. So um, through some extensive documentation, um, as, as you would do on any project like this, uh, to make sure that you're keeping the, the, the logs in the right place and at the right orientation, uh, but the structure was dismantled moved a couple miles and, and re reconstructed right adjacent to the, the new visitor center and placed in a setting that was probably much more indicative of um, a setting for that type of structure. You can see in the lower right hand corner uh, some of the replacement elements. There's, there's a couple down along the, the, the base of the structure and then some um, up in the, in the field. But, uh, of the log work. But, uh, that's, a, that's a project that I thought was unique and uh, pretty proud of. So again, um, I think it serves as, a, as an example of, of uh, the skill um, and the abilities and the resources that we have at the center. Moving from carpentry related work into masonry um, type work, uh, we have a long um, history of working with um, the folks down at Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine. If anybody hasn't been there, put it on your bucket list. This, this structure is magnificent. Um, it dates back to the Spanish period and is constructed out of coquina, which is a shell deposit. So it's uh, in many ways like a limestone material, um, yet in cross-section it looks just like a Rice Krispie bar. And it is as difficult to work with as a weak old Rice Krispie bar might be. Um, very friable. Um, we actually we cut this with a hand, a, a, a cross-cut saw. Um, it, it, it's just it, it's that soft, um, and, and it doesn't um, doesn't handle mechanized um, equipment uh, fabrication tools very well. Um, so again, an example, of the, the task of this project was to um, protect the, the wall heads. Where, uh, they were experiencing a great deal of moisture infiltration because the coping levels of wall heads. Um, were not well protected, um, moisture precipitating down through the wall and, and carrying with it um, the, the lime-based mortars. So the, the, the building was, was actually weeping and, and losing a lot of its um, lime-based binder um, and, and thus you know, causing a, a great deal of problems. One of the, the, the biggest problems it was causing was a great deal of organic growth and you, you can see that here beneath one of the scuppers and, and behind the man lift didn't look terribly problematic, but without a removal effort, it would it would grow till the walls were entirely green. And they realized that through a removal effort, um, they were actually pulling uh, masonry material with it. Um, so little by little, uh, the, the cyclic maintenance on the building was actually pulling the building apart. Uh, went through an extensive uh, testing of all types of, of herbicides. Um, we found that they left staining or they actually encouraged a, a breakdown of the material. So we, we really wanted, the, the approach was to, to address the root cause of, of uh, the, the deterioration in the scarf walls, and that was the wall heads. <clears throat> we continue to work at, at St. Augustine, at the Castillo, doing a, a variety of different, uh, different projects. Another very, very good project and uh, a good example of, of the skill um, of the masonry trades workers. Roof work. Roofs, roofs, roofs. Roofs, windows, doors are the big ones. And, and anybody who's a homeowner would, would understand that. Anybody who is, is, is taking care of assets or facilities within the, the city understand that uh, those are the items that, that cause you the most problems and the, the items that, that need to be attended to. You address all types of, of roofs, uh, whether it's your traditional um, red cedar um, shingles, um, or in the, the, the lower photos, uh, it's Alaskan yellow cedar um, shingles, fish scale. Um, the, the, the 
upper pictures are from Upper, upper De uh, not excuse me, not Upper Delaware, Delaware Water Gap. The lower photos are at Appomattox on a number of the buildings there. And we do a tremendous amount of loop work. Yes, sir. I've done a little bit of research on wood shingle roofs because I'm involved with the restoration and re roofing of an 18th century building, and we know that it had the side lap bevel edge shingle that was common among a lot of German immigrants to here in the valley, it's very, very common. And uh, I've talked to a number of different uh, managers who deal with these kinds of roofs on other historic sites, and they have given me some um, feedback about the difference between using tar paper underneath the wood shingles versus doing it in a historic way and not putting any tar paper. From what it sounds like to me, the best way is actually to not put tar paper because it allows for evaporation underneath. That is as correct. As opposed to you know, moisture getting under there and basically causing you know, rot. Mm -hmm. um, and also using copper naphthenate as a fungicide and preventing it from rotting a little bit you know, quicker than normally would. Um, do you guys have any say on whether or not you get to use the, the tar paper in these instances? Or? Well, We'll take a number of different approaches, and, and you know, I have to be honest, I can't speak to the specifics of either of these projects. I, mean, I, realize, I realize that architects, architects draw up the specs, you execute the plan that the architect has, right? Often. Uh, I say often. Uh, but one of the beauties, in many cases, and, and, and roof, roof work may not be one of those, the specs for our work are in situ, they're, they're there. All right, that, so you that, can just redo so we're, 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 we're redoing what was done historically. Now, in the case of a roof, chances are if it's a 100-year-old building, it's gone through a couple reiterations of, oh, yeah. of, of roofing. You're, you're absolutely correct in when you essentially have a vapor barrier on the underside of your shingles. Uh, the, the shingles are not breathing, and, and so they're staying saturated on one side, and they're drying um, much quicker on, on the surface, and it causes cupping and accelerated deterioration. Uh, it can also create a, a moisture trap in the substrate. So historically, we, we, we generally see lath roofing, um, and we're applying directly over the lath um, roof, so um, you, you have that, that air movement. Historic preservation is in, in a, a, a bit of a movement that I don't think we've experienced in, in many, many years where sustainability is a huge issue. And we, we, the federal government, can't afford to be putting on a, what should be a 50-year roof, putting one on every 20 years. Materials have changed. We're now we're dealing with new growth cedar and not old growth cedar. So, yes, we're replacing in kind, but but the physical properties of that material are entirely different than what they were historically. So, and I'll have to get back to you on the specifics, but there's a good chance that what you see there is, is black and might appear to be tar paper is actually, it's a mesh material. That, so you, you, you may put down ice and water shield, and then, then there's this, and I, I'm, the name is going to escape me, but it's like a mesh material that goes down so when the shingle lays down, it's not in direct contact with, with that, with the, vapor barrier. with the vapor barrier or ice and water shield, whatever it may be. That's, that's probably what you're seeing there. It's become pretty standard procedure for us. Not historically accurate, um, but neither are the shingles other than the species. Yeah, they saw them, or because I know the difference between sawn and ribbon is pretty dramatic in the way the cupping happens. Correct. Um, it, these. Again, I can't speak to the specifics. I would guess that for the Alaskan cedar, probably sawn shingles. It's, if I can get my terminology right, a shingle is, is sawn, a shape is split. I'm glad you mentioned side lap shingles. Um, there, there's a, a member of my staff who did his master's thesis on side lap shingles and is always looking for examples and always looking for an opportunity to share. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> He, he gets all excited about side lap shingles, um, something you don't see very often. Very often. So, a lot of roof work. And if it's not um, wood shingles, it could be asphalt, uh, with, you know, uh, CCC uh, error cabins out west where we're putting down asphaltic material, rolled roofing. 
Uh, this is the cemetery lodge of Antietam, and uh, it, was a, it was a pretty extensive slate roof project. Sort of great lengths to try to match the, the historic slate, but as with any stone product, um, more times than not, the original quarries are no longer functioning. Um, so we're, I, I know in this particular one, we had to go to great lengths to find something that, that matched in, in color. In this particular project, there, I think it was as much of a flashing job as it was a, a, a roofing job or shingle job. I acknowledge that we're, we're a little short on time, so I'm going to try to move through this uh, fairly quickly. Architectural section. This is the kind of work that uh, the, the architects are doing. Um, historic structures treatment reports. Um, I tried to pick uh, ones that uh, may be familiar to some. I just drove by this building this morning. It's the first time I've ever put my eyes on it um, on the lower left-hand corner. And it's over at your National Cemetery. Um, mm. They did an extensive project for the National Cemetery Administration where they were inventorying and doing assessment reports on National Cemetery lodges. And many of them are a mixed design. I can't speak to these, but uh, I won't say they were cookie cutter because it's evidence here that there's, there's some difference between these here. Um, the other one was down, just down the road here in, in how do you pronounce it, Virginia? Stanton? Stanton? Stanton. Stanton. Yeah. Stanton. Couple other examples. Those are non-NPS projects. Um, these here are Cape Cod Mission 66 Amphitheater. Typical of a lot of uh, work being done um, mid to late century in the National Park Service as we celebrated our 50th um, anniversary, our 50th birthday. And then out at Nicodemus AME Church out there um, was another building that they, they did assessment work on. Kind of the long and the short of it all is we get involved in a little bit of everything. Repatternization of bronze work um, on the Soldiers Monument, resetting um, cannonballs on the Rams Air Monument at uh, Cedar Creek, cast in place architectural concrete elements at Steamtown in Pennsylvania. Lower right hand corner is a mortar carriage that uh, was, was placed at Castillo de San Marcos. The church at Portsmouth Village on Cape Lookout uh, that, that had experienced a number of hurricanes and was listing, uh, you know, a number of degrees and needed to, to be uh, stabilized. So with a little pushing and pulling and uh, some framing member replacements, we were able to preserve that for another generation. And then this is a project we're working on right now and it's terribly fascinating. The Standing Lincoln Monument, which was um, designed and first cast by St. Gaudin, I think there's 11 of them throughout the country, and it's a 12-foot standing bronze. We have um, actually obtained the original molds, conserved those molds, and as we speak, we're casting a 12-foot bronze to, to sit on a, a masonry granite um, pedestal at St. Gaudens National Historic Site in New Hampshire. It's uh, certainly a real stretch, but we're very fortunate to have this gentleman here, Brian Griffin, who is uh, a, a extremely skilled conservator and, and metal worker. I'm going to take a quick dive into the, the training programs. Um, I, I made mention of a three-year exhibit specialist program, the three-year preservation specialist program, the core network work that we're doing, bringing in individuals, um, young adults, um, introducing them to, to historic preservation and the associated uh, traditional trades. Past program that I mentioned earlier is this two-year mentor-mentee program that, that is proving to be very successful. Um, we, we see many of the people applying for our three-year programs form a past trainees. So they get a taste of it over a two-year period of time, and then they, it not only prepares them to be competitive for those positions, but it, it really makes them well-suited for that work. Again, preservation skills workshops, these are going out um, into the communities or into parks to share our knowledge and skills. And, and help build skills. Crossover assignments are a big piece of our training initiative. If we're working down at Shenandoah National Park, there's a standing invitation for any park employee who wants to participate in that project, whether it's for a couple days or several weeks, to help hone their skills, develop skills. That's, our, that's an opportunity. Um, I use, I'll use this as our, 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 our fictitious example, but it could be real. If the, the city of Winchester had a project that was perhaps well suited for us. Through an agreement process, we could actually provide that service. 
if we had to do that for a non-federal entity, it's incumbent on that entity to have substantial participation in the project. That comes by sending your maintenance personnel to that project, considered substantial participation, ties it all together. Um, so uh, in my mind, it's a win-win-win, uh, but the resource is protected and preserved. People get training out of it. it it's really a, it's a good situation. We also do a lot of risk management training associated with the type of work we're doing, whether it's chainsaw safety training or equipment operator safety training, fall protection, lead abatement, all those types of things. So there's, there's quite a bit going on there. Preservation skills workshops um, can, can take place most anywhere. There might be a mock-up inside, a little demonstration piece on, on masonry tools and their applications. Lower left is um, assessment work. We'll put our architects out on, onto our, our, a site and they'll walk, walk students around and, and help them identify uh, architectural styling, architectural detail and period, um, as well as root causes of deterioration and then have those discussions about um, mitigation. Lower right is at Mupatki um, in Arizona, doing uh, masonry work associated with those um, ruins. Youth engagement, um, I've, I've touched on it a little bit. I want it to be my legacy to make sure that the training center has a very robust program for entry level folks, generally youth. There's a, a, a a large initiative within the National Park Service to engage youth, introduce that next generation of Park Service employees um, to the work of, of the NPS, and, and this is our way of contributing to, to this. In 2015, which was the, the first year that we really began to focus on this, we had uh, 30 young individuals um, that were participating in, in our project work as experiential learning, action learning. Uh, we feel it's the best way to develop skills in, in, in people is to put a tool in their hand and put them to work. In 2015, I want to say that we had 30 people, um, everywhere from six weeks to six months. A couple um, have been on for, well, we're on for a year, uh, for a total of upwards of about 30,000 hours of experiential learning. I think that's that's a really good start, and in 2016, we'll, we're hopeful to double those numbers. You said? What, what's a typical path for uh, youth that are not associated with the core program to get exposed to what you're doing? Trade schools, which are few and far between, coming out of the, the agricultural business. It's one of our great applicant pools uh, for a number of reasons. But there are a number of, of community colleges, secondary schools that are, are, are starting to, to pick up on this. And the one we've worked with the longest and had the most success is Belmont Tech out of St. Clairsville, Ohio. Um, it's a two-year associates program, and they introduce them to everything from masonry work to stained glass conservation to wall coverings to a, a number of different <coughs> activities. But there, there, there is not a good source. The vast majority of the youth that, that we are reaching are, are either current or former students in uh, historic architecture program, some type of preservation program, some of them are master level students that, that are coming out of academia. Um, so they don't have the trade skill, but they have the understanding of, of preservation and, and in many cases best practices. And it's just a matter of getting those tools in their hands so that they they can put a lot of that knowledge to, to practice. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The graduates of the College of Building Arts at Charleston? Yes, um, we're, we're familiar with that. Um, we have had students um, on our staff from uh, American Building College. Uh, they are, they're no longer with us, but I know one of them is working for the Forest Service in Oregon and another former <coughs> Building College person is at Fort Jefferson down in Everglades, Drive to Julia, so they're, they're still with the Park Service. SCAD, um, Savannah School of Building Art and Design, we, we have a couple um, employees right now from, from there. We, we made a shift, I made mention earlier, and I don't want to keep anybody past their lunch hour, but I'm going to stick around for, for a little bit here. 
the past practice was, as I mentioned, find folks that are coming out of the trades that have some of that basic trade experience, whether it's self-taught or they were working for a contract or they happen to be coming out of a, a technical school. That's what, that's the group we always targeted. We made a shift, it's maybe been eight or ten years ago, really looking at um, academic programs. And, and part of it was hiring mechanism. All of our interns are competitively selected through a federal hiring process, and it's a paid internship. Um, so they're, they're employed. Because we weren't able to, to reach those trades persons that we had always been able to reach, we started to look at educational programs because there were, there were certain authorizations for um, direct hiring authority. So I could go right into Belmont Tech and the professor would say, there's a good student for you and I could hire him, boom, um, with no competition. They wouldn't have to visit the USA Jobs website. Didn't have to visit USA Jobs. Uh, that's all changed now, and that's another whole discussion for another day. Um, but uh, it, it, it's it's really difficult to find the right the right people. We have direct what I refer to as direct hiring authority with the core. We put out an announcement: these are the positions we're looking for. We get our resumes, and we can just hand pick. So, if anybody has some young relative, son, daughter, grandson niece, nephew, and any of this sounds of interest, look us up, because that, that's how we're, we're working these days. The core is actually a good, good program. We're taking people that have never traveled out of the state of Maryland and sending them all over the country to include Hawaii and the Virgin Islands, and they're thrilled. Um, they're, they're learning more than trade skill. So it, it's, it's something that really, really excites me, and I, and I really enjoy seeing these young folks. The, the quality of applicants coming out of the core network is, is superior to what we generally see coming out of um, traditional hiring practices. How long do these young people stay with your program? They, they could be on for six weeks to six months, and in some cases a year. Um, but our goal is to, to provide them an introduction to the work of the center, provide us with an opportunity to observe them as, as an employee, as a person, as um, as a potential full-time employee, and then provide them with a, a, an opportunity for a gateway into federal service. Um, I didn't speak to it, but you have the, the core program, very entry level, with very little skill generally. The next step is that preservation specialist. So they're taking their you know, developmental level trade skill, and they, they're coming in, and they're going to have a the opportunity to compete for a three-year apprentice program, intern program, to develop their trade skills. If they're successful there, they can then um, have the opportunity to compete for one of those exhibit specialist programs. So our, our hope is not that they would stay with us for six or eight years, but maybe take their skills, practice somewhere, come back, hone their skills, and, and move on. So we're trying, trying to develop this tiered, tiered developmental program that will uh, address the needs of a variety of people, but also have kind of a succession or, or career ladder associated with it. Thank you very much for uh, your participation. Uh, hopefully what I shared was of some interest and if you have questions, Ed has my contact information. I failed to bring any business cards with me. But, uh, <laughs>